Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. At, uh, I hope this finds you and your families healthy and as well as possible in our upside down world. I'm Harry Haney, and I lead the Supply Chain Center here at Loyola, where we bring together the business and academic community to address supply chain challenges responsibly and sustainably. We do that in a couple different ways, including events like this and by bringing companies and students together to work on projects amongst other things. A couple of points about today's event. We, we very much want your questions, so please use the chat function. My colleague, Colleen Rainey, is going to help us with that. And after we introduce the speakers and go through some brief presentations, uh, They'll field, they'll field your questions. We are recording it and we'll send out a link afterwards. Our featured speakers today, Danielle Wood, who is a senior sustainability specialist at Duncan Brands and Aaron Dernbaugh, who is the director of the Institute of Environmental Sustainability here at Loyola University of Chicago. Danielle and Aaron are gonna start with a few words about themselves and their organizations and then really get into the subject matter. But before I turn it over to them, uh, I'd like to start with just a couple of thoughts. Uh, during such difficult times, it, it might be tempting to, to reduce the priority of sustainability in your organization, and, but now is really the time to be doubling down. Uh, nearly every organization, and, and most of us individually, are rethinking uh, how we do things and, and what is important in our lives, and, and now's the time to make changes that you may not have considered in February. And, uh, you know that old saying, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Another factor is that uh, according to a recent McKinsey study, about 90% of companies' environmental impacts come from supply chains. So I think the, uh, the, the implication is let's fish where the fish are, it's, it's in supply chain. And what we do now is going to impact our brand reputation beyond the crisis. Uh, there was a recent poll in, in sustainable brands uh, that found 75% of US adults said that how companies act now will impact their perspectives on them in the future. And the same amount said they'll, they're gonna remember the companies who stepped up. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Danielle. Uh, please take it away. Thanks, Harry, and thank you for having me today. Um, you'll see on uh, the first slide, I'll, I'll get right into it and keep it short. Um, but like Harry mentioned, my name is Danielle Wood, and I'm our sustainer, Senior Sustainability Specialist at Duncan Brands. So I lead our sustainability efforts for both Duncan and Baskin Robbins. So both brands um, in a global context as well, because we do have international business. Um, I've been with the brand over three years, so around three and a half, getting close to four years now. Um, originally started with our risk management team and um, pursued my, my master's or my MBA in sustainability and global supply chain management um, and then switched over to this role about two and a half years ago. So definitely passionate um, and really excited to talk with you all today. So on the next slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the brand. Um, so Duncan Brands, um, we have Duncan and Baskin Robbins. Both brands are actually 100% franchise, which makes our business model a little bit different, especially when you think about us in comparison to some of our competitors, some others in the QSR space. Um, so it's really important when we are making decisions, especially in sustainability, that we take into account our franchisees. So we really walk hand in hand through these initiatives. So our program for sustainability is called Partners for a Better Tomorrow. And whenever we're thinking about new initiatives that we're implementing, we always think of it from a three uh, pronged per perspective and approach. So guest impact, business impact, and then the environmental social impact. So whenever we're thinking of initiatives, we need to ensure that um, our franchisees, you know, we're trying to make them the most profitable that they can be, but also um, really make their business efficient. We want their opinions. We want them to test things out. We want them to be passionate about the brand, well, both brands. Um, and so we always bring them into the fold whenever we're putting initiatives through. But that's why sometimes you'll notice it does take us a little bit longer to get there because we have a, a few more channels to get through. On the next slide, you'll see um, our major focus areas. So packaging, of course, sustainable sourcing, energy efficiency. We have our own program called DD Green Achievement. It's kind of like a lead certification, but modeled to our Duncan fit. 
Um, and so we have a number of different criteria that our franchisees and restaurants must meet in order to achieve that status. Um, we have waste and recycling as a, a large focus area of ours, a little bit more challenging um, due to our franchise model. Obviously, we work very closely with nutrition, ingredients, new menu options, so optionality has been a real focus of ours. Um, and then lastly, reporting has been you know, a, a big focus area, especially in the minds of a number of different external stakeholders, but as well within our organization. Um, so I'll dive in um, on the next slide, just some of our sustainability initiatives that are continuing to move forward despite you know, the current state of the world. So on this slide, um, you might have seen that we've recently transitioned our global system to paper cups. In the US, we've transitioned to a double walled paper cup. It's paperboard is certified to the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Um, and this transition has removed around 1 billion foam cups from the waste stream annually. And we just completed this transition and announced it um, early this month. Um, so we're very excited about that. We've also started to roll out our new hot coffee cup lid. Prior to the current lid, it was not as widely recyclable, um, a little bit more difficult to in some municipalities. So we've transitioned um, a good portion of our system so far to a new polypropylene lid. Um, it is um, recyclable where facilities exist and we should be completing that transition later this year. And these two transitions are removing around 19 million pounds of polystyrene um, from the waste stream annually. So we're very excited about these sustainable packaging commitments and progress. On the next slide, um, you'll see some of our progress with DD Green Achievement. In 2018, we did unveil our new next generation concept store. So our new prototype for all new Duncan locations. Um, and it was really modeled after our DD Green Achievement uh, program. So modified to fit our DD Green specifications. However, our restaurant isn't automatically put into that duty green achievement fold. They still need to meet a number of criteria, go through the relevant certification checks um, in order to meet those standards. So since the launch of our original duty green achievement program in 2014, we have over 500 Duncan US restaurants meeting those standards um, and increasing that number each day. We've recently made a commitment to open our 1000th duty green achievement restaurant by the end of 2025. Um, and this was really in tandem with us recently meeting our goal um, set in 2016 of opening 500 DD Green Achievement restaurants by the end of this year. We met that goal early, um, you know, ahead of Earth Day, and we're really proud of that achievement. Um, originally, when we did launch our DD Green Achievement program, we expected our restaurants would save between 15 to 20 percent um, compared to the traditional Duncan restaurant model. However, our restaurants we're, we're finding are performing better than designed and reducing energy use by approximately 33%. Um, so we're very pleased with the progress of our DD Green Achievement restaurants and we're excited to move that pro uh, program forward. Um, and on the next slide, this is just you know, one of our most recent um, blog posts on Earth Day talking about our commitment to coffee um, and responsibly sourced coffee. So we partnered with World Coffee Research back in 2018 for a five-year commitment um, to really boost coffee sustainability efforts. That commitment will amount to around $2 million over the course of those five years. And we're really excited with the progress that World Coffee Research has been making. So some of the things that they're working on, which you can read more in the blog post attached, um, you know, they're working on new hybrid coffee plant varieties. So varieties that would be able to withstand some of the threats of climate change. World Coffee Research is very dedicated to farmer profitability. So they've been partnering with a number of different farmers in their network to test out different varieties, test out different soil management practices and some of, some of those other things. Um, and performing farmer field trials in order to determine what variety makes the most sense where in order to really boost farmer profitability. So we're very pleased with World Coffee Research and our partnership. And we have recently found out that we're one of the top donors um, as of this last year. And we you know, fully support World Coffee Research. And I highly recommend checking out their um, LinkedIn page and their website. They have a number of great webinars that go on. 
And then on the next slide, just, you know, here's my information. Um, I know we have a Q&A at the end of this, but feel free to contact me separately if, if need be, um, or if you just have questions or, or want to connect. Um, and then some additional information on our sustainability program and efforts. You can check out our most recent sustainability report at duncanbrands.com, or again, feel free to reach out to me. And I will toss it over to Aaron. Thanks, Danielle. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks also to um, Harry and Colleen for inviting me to be part of this conversation with Danielle today. Uh, it's certainly a good time, an important time to reflect on um, sort of the, the moment we're in and also the, the ways we can be mindful uh, and be very um, intentional in the actions we take as, as we respond, not only to the pandemic we have right now, but um, towards other uh, stresses that we might see in the future. So I'll just share a few slides very quickly uh, with on Loyola and Loyola Sustainability Initiative, and then share a few thoughts on sort of how this moment is impacting higher education. More generally, um, the slide, actually, can we go back one slide? Um, Thanks. So I always start with this slide because sustainability efforts um, at whatever institution, be it a, a institution of higher education or a corporation or a gov government structure, really um, need to be anchored in uh, the, the identity and the, the core business or core mission of the institution. And for Loyola, we certainly are an educational institution. We're focused on educating the students that come to the university, but we're also um, anchored in our uh, identity as a Jesuit institution with a mission of social justice. So I always start with, this is the view looking uh, east over Lake Michigan from our chapel, Madonna de la Strada, and it really helps me ground in, uh, ground myself in our identity and our sustainability efforts really are, are um, oriented towards that uh, mission of social justice. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that we're working towards is, is captured in this image, which is carbon neutral for scopes one and two by 2025. We announced this in 2015 uh, at an event with uh, recognizing Pope Francis's encyclical on ecology, Laudato C. But uh, we've been doing greenhouse gas inventories annually um, since 2012. And we have a baseline of actually 2008. And so we're really focused on how can we address our emissions and operating an institution you know, 6 million square feet, 17,000 students, 4,000 employees, uh, and how can we um, make this part of our operations and also incorporate it into things like our, our academics and our, um, our community-oriented work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what have we done um, beyond reducing our greenhouse gas footprint? Um, that, that carbon neutral goal of carbon neutral by 2025, as of our last um, report, our, our FY 2018 report, we were 54% of the way um, towards that goal of carbon neutral. Well, we've also adopted environmental literacy into the core curriculum, meaning every undergraduate student needs to take a class that addresses sustainability science and environmental literacy. Um, beyond that, we have over 1,300 courses each uh, year, that should say, sorry, not semester, that address a sustainability learning outcome. Uh, we had a group of faculty come together and define what that means in a series of outcomes that are really interdisciplinary. Um, we have a diversity of schools and departments. Uh, school of Business is who's hosting this event, but we see it in our School of Public Health. We see it in our School of Nursing. We see it across the institution. Um, none more than the academic unit that I'm housed in, which is the Institute of Environmental Sustainability, which is a whole school uh, focused on environmental and social justice issues. And then our Climate Action Plan I talked about, and then our 2020 strategic plan, uh, which you can see uh, the image here on the screen, building a more just, humane, and sustainable world, which integrates social and environmental justice. Um, next slide. So this has my contact information. Uh, feel free if anyone would like to reach out to me to learn more about what Loyola is doing or visit either the two links that are here, um, luc.edu slash sustain Loyola, or uh, an effective way is looking at our STARS report. STARS is the tool that we use to track and report our sustainability efforts across uh, academic, the operational, and the administrative functions of the university. But I did want to take a minute just to reflect a little bit on uh, how we're seeing um, sustainability programs affected at this moment um, as it relates to COVID-19. And, um, and so that 
I'll, I'll just make a few observations and then we can get into the Q&A section. Um, the first observation is one that probably doesn't come as any shock to anybody on this call, but um, you know, universities and schools are certainly um, uh, you know, uncertain what the enrollment's going to look like this fall. Uh, many pushed back uh, deadline uh, for for uh, students enrolling or depositing to come to campus. Um, some students, either because of uncertainty with um, health and safety uh, or financial um, requirements, are choosing not to come back to campus. Others may choose to not enroll. But on the other hand, um, sort of a force that we have yet to see what the impact will be, uh, but we saw this certainly during the economic downturn in 2008, is um, either professionals or folks who maybe don't have all the job opportunities are deciding to go to school, or maybe they're going to go back to retool to find different um, skills that they would like to have to move forward in, the, in their careers or in their workplace. Uh, that's going to see, we, we have yet to see exactly what the impacts of that. Some campuses are a bit being hit, pardon me, harder than others. Uh, some, and some of it depends, the financial implications may depend on, you know, how much of their, um, their operation budget comes from their, uh, their tuition, their enrollment. Uh, but there is an opportunity here with sustainability, at least sustainability in the academics, because it often is something that's seen as an opportunity to add skills. Uh, sustainability is a growing field across lots of sectors, and so there's lots of new academic programs in sustainability where a student can go back and add another certification, another credential. It could be related to operational things like supply chain management, or it could be in um, tracking and reporting. It could be in change management. There's lots of different ways to to approach that. A second observation is just related to this move to online. Um, this was part of a much larger trend in higher education going on for, for years and years, but obviously a lot of campuses had to rapidly move online um, at the end of the spring semester. And the effective institutions will learn from that process and incorporate the good while also tackling the negative. There can be um, things which are harder to, to take on board in a purely online model. So um, that's something that we're gonna see institutions wrestle with uh, and the effective ones you know, will take the good uh, while, not lose, while addressing the bad. Um, there are some environmental, some sustainability, and certainly some equity and inclusion benefits to these digital connections. I don't wanna lose any of those. Um, there's different learners that can really uh, succeed well in an online model in a way that others, um, you know, may, might feel a little excluded. We all learn differently, and you know, being able to receive these kinds of materials in this in this format can be can be a great benefit. Um, those are two just general observations related to higher ed. Uh, two other observations I wanted to make um, related to sustainability, and this kind of cuts across any sectors. Our one is sustainability programs. Danielle, I'm sure you have a long list of it in your world, but uh, we often have, have a, a deep toolbox of efficiency and cost savings ideas at hand. And so when we come into a time, time of some financial constriction, um, sustainability offices can often be a good place to turn. They might be a helpful resource, uh, whether it's energy efficiency, demand response, strategic procurement practices. Um, so they have opportunities and ideas ready to roll out, ready to bring to the table. Uh, they also have good experience working with different partners. We want to, part of our role is to communicate change and to do it effectively, to think about systems and to normalize um, that change, normalize. We've seen a lot of behavior change across the globe in response to this pandemic. And we're gonna see more of that. Sustainability offices can be a place to turn on how to communicate that change and how to normalize it. Um, sustainability practitioners uh, have learned how to be very savvy change managers um, because oftentimes as we're trying to roll out sustainability efforts, we don't have a lot of money, a lot of um, authority in rolling those out. So we have to be uh, a little bit more um, quick on our toes in, in delivering those. And then the last one I'll just say is um, related to shocks like this. So this has been quite a dramatic shock, uh, very quick, very quick in how it's spread, but also how the response um, to COVID-19 has, has been addressed. Uh, 
But we expect in a changed climate to see a lot more of these shocks over time. Uh, NOAA just put out the re recent report. Uh, this is expected to be a very active hurricane season. Uh, and for folks that are in those areas, they know what a shock that can be to business as usual. So how can we build more resiliency into our systems and to our communities where we're engaged? Um, we do that through communications. We do that through effective systems, um, through our sourcing. Hope to talk about that a little bit and also just generally systems thinking. So how can we do that and how can we, how can sustainability be seen as a resource to build more resiliency? Um, yes, maybe some redundancy into our system so that when these kinds of shocks hit us in the future, uh, we can have positive out, outcomes. Um, how, uh, and then I guess I'll just say because of our social justice lens at Loyola, in that process of resiliency, how can we keep equity and inclusion at the forefront so that it's not just resiliency to some, but it's resiliency for all. Uh, those were some observations I wanted to share with folks on this uh, on this webinar. And then I'll turn it back to Harry uh, and Colleen, who I think are going to um, lead us through a little bit of a Q&A session um, to address some other uh, areas of what we're seeing in sustainability at this time. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Aaron and Danielle, both. Uh, we're going to start the Q&A now, so uh, type your questions in. But we have a few in our uh, in our back pocket to get us started. Um, some, some respects, the, the current health concerns are causing organizations to step back from some strategies that have reduced waste, uh, such as reusable cups or cloth bags at grocery stores. What about those programs? I, I know, Danielle, you had, uh, Duncan had a, had a reusable cup program up until uh, a few months ago. Sure, yeah, so I can start. Um, so yes, we did have a reusable cup program um, and we did take a pause on that program really for the public good and to keep our crew members and our guests safe. You know, that was the number one priority. Um, we do really have some loyal customers out there who are very passionate about sustainability and, you know, bringing in the reusable cups. Um, so now we're really taking this time to, to learn, you know, to observe. Um, to really better our reusable cup program. That way we can, you know, when we come out of this and we have a new normal, our program fits that new normal. So, um, you know, safety is really our top priority right now and, you know, in general. Um, so things like reducing touch points in our restaurants, that's something that we've really been focusing on. Obviously masks and gloves, um, you know, increased delivery and curbside pickup. We you know, have installed sneeze guards and, you know, really just thinking out of the box and trying to be innovative during this time. So um, I, I wouldn't say we believe our uh, reasonable cup program will be paused forever, um, but we're really using this time to come out of this. That way our program can be better than it currently, you know, is, and it really fits whatever this new normal is going to be. Yeah, I'll just add, we are going to see an increase in, in some of those materials. And, um, but I, I hope that over time, we really can get to sort of a science-based approach to that. Some of that is, is, is completely justified and necessary. And, um, you know, in, in order to keep, if, if we want to have some of these services, we're going to need to use some of these items to keep both sides of the transaction safe um, and, and healthy. But I also think um, with time, and, you know, this is, we're dealing with this pandemic, but public health is just something we should be focusing on, um, you know, more generally across the board. Uh, so if we do need to put uh, things in place that keep that health, uh, you know, that, that healthy uh, distance in place, then, then that's, that's perfectly fine and sustainability should support it. If social health, public health is gonna be part of your sustainability platform. Um, I, I was pleased to see Danielle's slides on some of the materials, though, that they're choosing to do that then can be facilitated in a recycling program or, you know, don't have sort of an infinite lifespan in a, in a landfill somewhere. So uh, it may direct us, even if we have disposable items, into disposable items that have a life cycle that, um, you know, doesn't, you know, it can be as, as benign as, as possible. Definitely. I, I fully agree with that, Aaron. And I think, you know, with the, the pausing of many reusable cup programs and just reusable usage in general, you know, you can't bring a reusable into a grocery store anymore to fill up, you know, your granola and, and things of that sort. So 
I do predict we will see an increase in single use packaging. However, you know, what we're doing on our side and what we've been doing over the last few years, um, well, probably the last 10 years, you know, of us getting out of the foam cup, um, We've really been looking at all of our packaging and reducing our consumption as our top priority um, with regards to packaging sustainability. Um, and for that, you know, we're really thinking ahead if there is an increase in these single use, you know, packaging items, what, what can we do? What can we switch to? And that's why we're still, you know, moving forward with our initiatives. Our consumers are demanding it, but we're also, you know, holding ourselves up to that standard as well. And this is why it's important that this is a supply chain conversation in this webinar, because it really does. I know we struggle with this just even at Loyola, um, you know, with sourcing materials that then can fit, feed into our programs, whether that's into a recycling program or a composting program. Um, you need to have items that, uh, they, that can be served by that, that waste process. So, um, you know, it, it is a conversation that needs to go, you know, a, from origination, you know, to eventual demise and, um, and, and understand the life cycle or the total cost of ownership um, of, of that. It might be a single item, but it has a much larger uh, story to tell. Colleen, I think you had a, had a question from the, from the audience. I do, I do, thanks Harry. We have a bunch of questions rolling in, so thank you very much. Um, the first one I have is directed at both of you. How do you advertise the great work that you've done on sustainability? And are the respective marketing teams embracing and leveraging this with your customers? Sure. Um, so I can, I can take a, um, the first or start it off. Um, so I, I'm not sure if the question is in the context of, you know, just our general marketing for sustainability or currently during this time. So I'll kind of touch both angles. Um, we really work in partnership with our marketing team with regards to our sustainability initiatives. Um, and with, in, with respect to sustainability, I think a lot of the times and certain, you know, consumers or other stakeholders don't really understand sustainability to the full extent. You know, in some cases, it can be very technical to understand, you know, when you're thinking of, you know, the different types of plastic and, and all of these other initiatives that we're doing. Um, so it's really important to work with those marketing team experts that way they can best communicate it to all different stakeholders um, and what we're still doing and still trying to figure out our best approach for marketing um, over the last few years you know what what makes the most sense to to say and when and we definitely are you know a values-led brand and for the majority of our last I would say decade of working on you know some sustainability initiatives we haven't done a lot of vocal marketing around some of these initiatives. And I think it was just us trying to figure out, um, you know, what makes the most sense for our brand? What, what do consumers really care about? Um, and we definitely don't want to throw a bunch of technical jargon at them. Um, so I would say in recent years, we've been trying to approach different groups, um, you know, through different, different media. So social media has been a huge um, angle or, avenue for us to use, you know, a lot of millennials, Gen Z's are using social media. So we've seen that's a really positive way to engage our different audiences through social media, you know, Instagram, all those different um, apps, but also, you know, we have had a number of franchisees who have been um, advertising our sustainability efforts in store and through, you know, new store openings, they'll definitely promote some of our initiatives that way. Um, so we've really tried to try a different number of angles. You know, we'll do blog posts um, and different, different things of that sort. We've also have a number of partners. You know, we attend a different conferences and try to, you know, work with a number of different groups. You know, Sustainable Coffee Challenge, when we think of um, coffee sustainability, or we'll work very closely with World Coffee Research and use some of, you know, their, their efforts and learnings to better um, describe some of the partnerships that we do have. Um, but I would say, you know, it's a continuous learning experience for us with regards to marketing sustainability um, because we, you know, still want to be that values led brand without, you know, over communicating or over sharing um, or trying to give ourselves, you know, too many pats on the back when we still have areas that we do need to focus on. Um, and then I would say with regards to marketing during, you know, a pandemic, um, 
we definitely don't want to be toned up to the current situation. So, um, you know, we've, we've been much quieter about sustainability. I would say we, we did recently put out a release, you know, describing our new goals for DD Green Achievement and our recent progress with our, um, you know, moving out of our foam cup, which, you know, we really wanted to share with the public because it, it was a huge undertaking for us and we believe you know, it's for the greater good and our consumers and other stakeholders are very pleased with that. Um, so it's definitely an interesting balance right now to, um, you know, not trying to be toned up, but also trying to talk about some of the work that we are doing. I think during this time, we've really been utilizing our Joy and Childhood Foundation um, and working in tandem with our franchisees because we have franchisees all over the world that are just doing some great work in their communities. You know, Duncan and Baskin Robbins, they're very beloved community brands. Um, and, you know, during this time, we're really trying to showcase our franchisees and the amazing work that they do all year round, but especially, you know, when a disaster hits or a pandemic hits. So um, it's, it's definitely a change from what you might normally see from us, but we're really trying to showcase those heroes in our communities, you know, our franchisees, our guests. Um, and that's kind of how we're how we're balancing things at this time but um that's that's kind of how we we take a look at marketing sustainability i know that was that was a lot in in uh one response but i think it really depends on uh what specifically you're looking to market yeah yeah i'll just say on behalf of loyola very quickly um for one, we, we know that uh, we have different audiences to communicate to. We have our, our sort of internal audience, our, our employees, we have somewhat uh, next tier, maybe alumni. And then of course we have our, our students are who we're here to serve and who we're here to give give our, our resources and knowledge and, and learning experience to. Um, the, for, the, for the students, we know sustainability is a differentiator. We have a survey that we do automatically to students as they enroll to come to Loyola and we ask them directly how important was Loyola's sustainability programs and commitment to your decision and half of all students say it was important or very important in their decision to come to Loyola. We're in a crowded market here in the Chicagoland region, a lot of great schools, um, but also amongst Jesuit schools, schools that um, our, our sister schools, there's 27 uh, Jesuit colleges in the United States that um, in some ways have a, have a similar identity or story to what Loyola has. So, so we do know that, that it makes a difference and it's important, become a, an important part of our identity and who we are. Um, but we also have to be mindful that, uh, I'm sure Danielle would agree with me here, we're, we're speaking to lots of different audiences. Um, it's not just uh, maybe the the customer, if you will, in a student at Loyola, it's also our employees. Um, it's also our, the communities where we're based. So the, the neighborhoods where our universities, are, our campuses are located. So um, yeah, we have to be thoughtful on uh, communicating to all those audiences and giving them the resources to, to both understand sustainability and also to you know, take action in support of those, those goals. Perfect, thank you both. Um, I have a question for Danielle, and it's considering around the topic of safety. How do you enforce new safety procedures for employees and customers within your franchise structure? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yes, we are 100% franchise and uh, our, our franchisees do make the majority of decisions. However, um, when it comes to safety, food safety, physical safety, we have, you know, strict brand standards and that's really how we're um, managing, you know, the, the use of masks, the use of the sneeze guards in the stores uh, or in the restaurants. Um, so we are mandating those at, at the restaurant level, for example, in a number of markets, you'll see that, um, you know, dining rooms are, are able to be opened, but as a brand standard, we're still enforcing that they stay closed. So we are, um, working in tandem with the, the local governments, you know, the federal government, but um, we do have our own, you know, a little bit stricter standards with regards to safety, you know, trying to do the best for our crew members, franchisees, um, and guests in order to make everyone feel safe when they enter a Dunkin' or drive up through the drive through um, And we work, you know, in partnership with our franchisees. So we have our operations team, you know, they'll go out and um, make sure everyone is trained and uh, the increased uh, 
food safety and physical safety standards because that's a, a huge importance for us as well. Um, so that's really how we are, are managing that. Great, thank you. Erin, um, this might be a good one for you. Are you seeing valuation models applied on short, medium, and long-term applications for justifying efforts? And I'm gonna add around sustainability. Um, yeah, I mean, because things are changing all the time and we're really unsure, um, you know, where this is going to land for us and, and we're just in one, you know, region. I can't imagine what it's like for Danielle trying to think across all the different geographies and, and how things are different in different places. But for us, it's all near term. Um, everything is very much today and reacting to what the situation is today and the next um, term as both the local and the state government sort of puts forward. It's um, guidelines and resources. But uh, yeah, I mean, there, part of it is a, a longer term vision for what, you know, I don't really like this phrase, but what the new normal might look like. Uh, so, so there is some, some medium term thinking that, that's starting to, to generate, but a lot of it is sort of near term reaction at this moment. Um, but I do think those of us that, I guess I'm in a little bit of a, um, a lucky role here is that I, I also get to step back and think about this in, in broader context, like the comments I made earlier about climate change and other shocks and stresses that we'll see to our systems going forward, uh, is what can we learn from these moments and what are the examples of success and failure that um, we can try to, uh, yeah, to learn from and share and communicate, obviously this this webinar is a good example of one of those, but um, I'm sure there are many others. And that's what I've been doing is with my peers from other institutions, other schools, is trying to learn from not just their reaction and, and the experience they're having when they take some action in response, but also, um, you know, how are the things we can put together uh, that would help us in the future the next time um, a shock or a challenge like this presents itself. Great, thank you. Uh, Danielle, I have a question for you. How it, it's more of a supplier question. So how is Duncan ensuring that their suppliers and their franchisees are staying up to date with ongoing FDA and NSF requirements with the current and future concerns due to COVID-19? Sure. So even uh, prior to COVID, you know, we have strict supplier um, and obviously franchisee standards with regards to safety. Um, we have a supplier code of conduct that all of our suppliers must sign um, and we do, you know, verify against that. Um, we do have a quality assurance team that does regular checks on our suppliers. Um, and especially during this time, I would say, you know, we were fairly close with our suppliers prior to COVID. And I would say, um, even more so now because we're constantly checking in, making sure that all standards are being set and we have a really great um, line of communication between our suppliers. So if, you know, you know, anything should go awry, you know, during this time, we're prepared for it. Um, but we really are keeping that line of communication open and um, really enforcing our already established standards with regards to, you know, quality assurance and uh, our supplier code of conduct standards. Great, thank you very much. Let me see what else I got. There's some really long ones in the chat. If y'all want to read some of those ahead of time, um, you know, we talked about um, sanitation a little bit already. Um, I just found one a second ago and now I got distracted, sorry. Um, Danielle, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Harry. Do you have uh, another one? I'm going to look for one more. Okay. Let's talk about reporting a little bit uh, and the, the challenges that we have right now with kind of things kind of being upside down. Reporting was never particularly easy because it seems like most reporting or accounting systems are, are talking or are, are geared around dollars or, or currency instead of, uh, of carbon. But uh, maybe maybe you guys could talk about some of the how you're addressing some of the reporting challenges that uh, that you're faced with right now. Sure. Danielle, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm happy to start. Um, so it's interesting because a lot of the reporting for us has still remained, you know, on the same schedule. Um, however, during this time, you know, we are moving forward with reporting business as usual, but I think it's important for us to not give ourselves too much of a pat on the back. Um, 
because of course we'll be seeing positive results. You know, you see all over the news that, you know, the air is cleaning, we're not emitting as much. However, you know, things won't always be that way. And we can't say that, you know, we're intentionally, you know, doing these things. So, you know, we're not traveling as much for employees, of course, we're not traveling at all. You know, we're not in our corporate offices um, and things of that nature. So I think when we think about reporting, um, we're already thinking about next year. And that's why we do have benchmarking from year to year. Um, and that way we can, you know, thoroughly explain, okay, there was a drop in our emissions significantly this year. Um, was it due to some of the initiatives that we're, you know, undertaking? Of course, in part, yes. Um, but we also need to be mindful that, you know, we are in the midst of a pandemic and it isn't business as usual, you know, going to the office, things like that, travel. Um, so we are trying to put all of our reporting in the context of that. That way we're not, you know, greenwashing or doing anything of that nature because this is an unprecedented time as we've heard, you know, countless times. Um, and I think it's interesting because the, the big question in the air is, you know, what does sustainability look like during a pandemic? What does it look like after a pandemic? Um, but we've seen, you know, recent activity through the SEC, some of their advisory committees that they're still calling for ESG disclosures, you know, additional sustainability reporting, which is, you know, obviously amazing from um, my perspective and in my role. And um, that way we can just have a cohesive level of standards to compare between industries, you know, across businesses. So you do still see an importance despite the current situation. And I think if anything, it's, it's calling um, these different, um, you know, data collection uh, companies like Sustainalytics or ISS to really take a look at the standards and and see you know how can we simplify that way it's easier for investors and other stakeholders to understand so with regards to our reporting we do report to a number of different entities obviously for investor reporting um, but also for our commitments there's a number of different NGOs out there who have um, trackers of progress based on commitments. So we do report to all of those, um, you know, when requested or even without being requested um, or without request. Um, and then we do have our sustainability report that's biannually reported to, um, you know, out to the public and we follow the GRI standards with that. So it, it's a very interesting time, um, but I think it's important just to keep the contextual piece in there that, uh, you know, although you might see positive numbers this year, we have to think about the bigger picture and continue to progress forward. Yeah, as someone who teaches a class on sustainability tracking and reporting, I, I, I'm thinking about this quite a bit and how this, uh, you know, is is a bit of an anomaly, but also what can we learn from it? Um, we've even created some, I guess I call them natural experiments at Loyola, looking at what can we accomplish when our campus is empty? What can we do from energy perspective? Um, you know, what, what does a baseline look like? Uh, you, you can model that with engineers, but until you actually sort of empty the buildings out and, um, and turn them down as low as it'll go, uh, you, you don't get a feel for where you can go. So we're trying that, trying to sort of understand what our benchmark is. Um, I sit on the steering committee for STARS, which is the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System. It's the tool that's used for um, tracking and reporting and, and, and building towards sustainability in higher education. And we're having some very interesting conversations of how do you, until you get rated in that sort of like lead at different levels at a reporter status, a bronze, silver, gold, platinum. And so how, what does that mean? Can, can campuses achieve platinum in the year 2020 uh, if they see significant reductions in something like operational, uh, you know, reduction in energy or greenhouse gases? Um, there's certainly academic and administrative uh, credits as well in STARS, but, um, you know, which we will probably see a, you know, a hit on those. Those won't be so positive because we won't have as much of those that programming on campus or those more creative classes or, or, or learning experiences. And so so it is it is a challenge. Um, what I think is going to be interesting is we do annual greenhouse gas accounting with an organization called uh, Second Nature uh, in their um, 
in their tool, in their reporting tool. And so I think we're going to see some very interesting data. I think the important thing is actually to collect data uh, where you can, if it doesn't take too much away from your efforts or from your other priorities, but where you can collect data in this time. Um, institutions that do will actually come out of this with more learning on what, what they can and can't do going forward. Maybe what are some goals? Uh, it does set the benchmark of where you can aspire to in, in, in some ways. Uh, I don't want to say it in too much of a positive way because it's sort of being done in a, in a little bit of a, uh, you know, in a sad way, but, um, but yeah, it, it is an interesting question. I think those reporting systems, the GRIs, the, the STARS, the CDPs, um, I, I would imagine they're having some very interesting conversations on how they, how they deal with it. Some of it does become, going back to a question you know, from, from a while ago on marketing and communications, it also becomes, we need to make sure our marketing departments don't, you know, try to make something out of this that it isn't. Um, hey, we saw this great carbon reduction. Well, you know, be careful because what we'll get the next year. So um, I, I think we also as sustainability practitioners have to sort of manage the message in this time as well and know when's the right time uh, to really um, communicate what we're seeing externally. Uh, that's, that's a good point. Uh, so there, there was one of the questions in here that I'm going to try to, to condense it a little bit. It was sort of a, it was a two-part question. Uh, and it was about what programs have you found to be the most impactful? And that if you don't have anything in place, where do you start? Uh, so maybe uh, you guys could take a, take a crack at that. And I may add some thoughts as well. Go ahead. So uh, Aaron or, or Danielle, who, who wants it first? I'll jump in just because I think mine's maybe a little easier. Um, I, I, I sort of started with it on my remarks on this webinar is I think sustainability needs to be grounded in the mission of the organization. Um, and it, for any organization, any group, any individual for that matter, to think about where they want to go on their sustainability journey, it is, it is a take a little bit of reflection uh, what's the core, um, you know, business that you're in? What what's your intention? What's your identity? And, and where do you, where do you want to go? And how can sustainability initiatives, um, social, environmental, economic aspects of it, support that mission? As I mentioned with Loyola, this mission as uh, as educators and um, towards social justice. That's why our sustainability efforts are really grounded in that. Yes, we're focused on our energy use, our, our carbon footprint, or how much water we consume, so the operational aspects, but um, really it's towards the, the social impact that unsustainable behavior would, would realize. So I guess that's where I suggest um, organizations to start. Uh, and then to sort of move to some simple metrics, the simple numbers that you can track and, and report um, are good places to start. Yeah, I definitely echo Aaron's thoughts. Um, and one thing that's really helped ground us within our, you know, values and our mission um, has been we conduct a an annual materiality assessment with an external third party. Sometimes companies will do them internally. Um, we prefer to get, you know, an outside perspective. Um, and during a materiality assessment, you know, they interview a number of key stakeholders internally that work on sustainability, but also those that aren't as close to it. Um, you know, a, a different, a real different mix of individuals who work within Duncan Brands, but also we have external stakeholders um, that might not even work with us at all, but who are experts in the industry and really can give us a um, a harsh look at, you know, what we're currently doing. Are we focusing on the right areas? Because like Aaron was saying, you know, we're, we're dabbling in all these different areas, but when we're, we're looking at impact, we're trying to make the, the largest impact that we can or um, an impact that really makes sense for our brand. So, um, you know, sustainability is such, you know, a broad, um, you know, broad area that we need to make sure it makes sense for our business. And it goes into all of our different um, functions, you know, supply chain marketing, all of those different things, you know, what makes the most sense for us. So that's really helped ground us. Um, and it's been a nice, you know, at times it might be a redirect if we're focusing too much into one area that might not make the most sense for us. Um, it might be a great time for us to take a look at it and potentially step back or even invest further into that area if we're not making um, as big of an impact as we should be. 
with regards to successful programs that we've we've done, you know, through the materiality assessment, it's helped define those, you know, key focus areas for us. Um, you know, it's cheesy to say, but I think all of the different, you know, initiatives that we've done, they have been impactful. Um, I think the level of impact obviously is different based on, you know, category and things like that. But um, even the smallest initiative that we, we might do or the smallest project we might do has an impact somewhere. So for example, we have, um, you know, partners in our key coffee growing origins um, that have been donating food kits during this time to um, local farmers, uh, farmers within our supply chain, but also, you know, out, out of our supply chain. Um, and although that might be small to some, it's, it's really impactful to those farmers who are in need right now who are facing food insecurity. So um, I think it's really best to start with a materiality assessment. That way you don't have a thousand ideas and you're trying to get down to one, but it's, it's nice to step back and have someone else give you that, that input as well as you know, some of your colleagues, colleagues you don't work with. So that's, that's definitely my recommendation. Great, thank you both very much. And we do have one question that came in a little bit earlier today um, via email. And this is maybe um, a general supply chain question, but what are some of the best approaches to enforcing contracts with suppliers that provide a long back order date or canceled orders during the pandemic? So any advice you would give on this topic would be great. Sure. So I think the, the you know, most important piece is really building, you know, of course, pre-COVID, you really need to build those strong relationships with your suppliers. Um, and every supply chain relationship is different. You know, they all have different terms. Um, different businesses have different terms. Different commodities or segments have different terms. Um, so that piece, that piece doesn't really change within the context of a pandemic. Right now, you're seeing demand is extremely volatile. You know, you have, um, you know, weeks where it's up and weeks where it's down. It's really hard to predict where you know the next few weeks will will be on that that scale. Um, but so it's important to plan ahead. Make sure your teams are in constant contact with your supply chain um, partners all throughout. That way, you have contingencies in case anything should fall through. Um, that's another another piece that we're definitely focused on. You know, of course, prior to COVID, and most businesses do this as well. But you have, you know, contingency planning and uh, contingency planning with regards to your supply chain. So you have a number of different supply chain partners who can, you know, get you the items that you need. Um, that way, the disruption to the supply chain isn't as um, volatile during during disasters or pandemics and, and things of that sort. So I think really maintaining your supplier relationship is important. That way, you know, if you do need to call on them um, or if you do need to uh, extend a payment term or, or things like that, it's a little bit more flexible. Um, so that would be my advice there. I agree with you, Danielle. Any, any thoughts on that, Aaron? No, I was, I was thinking of um, actually sort of slightly different. It probably doesn't address the, the question, but some of the things Danielle was, was talking about, I was thinking of as we connect to the supply chain conversation to sustainability and even some of the examples that Danielle gave for Duncan, um, the materials we choose, the relationships we have also are ways not just to reinforce, but also to communicate our sustainability commitments. For folks that know Loyola, who are on this call, um, they know, they've walked our campus, they know of our biodiesel program, they know they've probably washed our hand, washed their hands with our bio soap, um, which is, you know, made with a waste product from the biodiesel process. Uh, and so, in a way, those become demonstrations of our commitment to sustainability, it's just one thing. It, it, it's not our full supply chain, all the different items we're bringing onto campus, but um, but it's a chance for us to demonstrate not just our sustainability efforts, but our commitment to connecting the operational and the academic experience through sustainability, um, sort of making an applied sustainability lesson, if you will. Um, and it may not surprise anybody, but we have folks in the lab right now uh, working on making hand sanitizer uh, for that return to campus in the fall. So um, we don't know that we'll be able to do it, 
across all our campuses, but they're they're working on it to see if we can. Um, so be on be on the lookout for the next um, next next great outcome there for Loyola. But. Great. Well, that's a, some terrific discussion here today. We we really appreciate it. I would just ask for any any closing comments or remarks, uh, Danielle or Aaron, before we break. Sure. I just want to say thank you so much for you know having us today. I think you know sustainability is really important, and it the education piece is really key. You know, getting buy-in from your stakeholders, talking about your different initiatives finding new innovative ways to address a common issue um, that maybe others might not have thought about before. Um, so, and the, the one great thing about sustainability is it is ever changing. And I think you need to put that into context when you think of different initiatives, because you might start out with a plan this year for 2025 and along the way, it might have a little bit of bumps and, and things are along, the along the road. Um, so it's important when you're in this field to understand that you're not always going to get a yes or get buy-in from all the different groups, um, but you need to find a new way to address that issue or to address that different audience. So um, that would be my advice if, if you're entering you know, sustainability and I'm happy to answer any questions or feel free to email me if you have any more specific questions. I'm always happy to talk about sustainability. <laughs> Great, thank you. I just wanted uh, I just wanted to go back to the comment that was made about the impact of supply chain, uh, since this with this you know webinar and hopefully many of the folks on the on this are are in maybe their industry or the industry they hope to get to. It's just the impact that can make. Um, so building those relationships and really communicating down through the supply chain, um, the different vendors and suppliers that you work with, uh, your commitment, your organization's commitment, and institutions' commitment, um, the goals you've set. And, and how that then gets, um, you know, you know, pushed up and down uh, the chain, so or network, whatever you want to think about it. Um, I think that's important to recognize and not just write it off as the, you know, um, whatever lowest best cost, but actually you're building relationships and the relationships that help you meet your your goals uh, towards sustainability. So thanks for bringing that up at the beginning of the call. All right. Well, with that, I'll thank everyone, thank our speakers, in particular, Aaron and Danielle, Colleen for helping us, and thank you all for being here with us this afternoon. I hope this was what you had in mind, and uh, we hope you'll come back and see us again soon. Thank you. <laughs>